Hey, it's Mazzy. This is Memories of a Vinyl Junkie. Haven't done these in a while. This is my jazz journey. Now, I do have a playlist containing all my Memories of a Vinyl Junkie videos, but I haven't done one in a while. And most of them showcase one particular year, and I pull out albums from my collection from that year, and I talk about what the music means to me, what I was going through during the time. So they're a little bit of a self-therapy. And those of you who don't like self-absorbed people, um, you might not like these. But it's it's the journey and the process and what the music means to me. In a way, uh, I make these videos probably mostly for the future, for my son Joseph, who doesn't really watch my videos. He's too... Uh, He's got too many things right now, but hopefully someday he'll um, enjoy these when I'm off to the uh, record library, wherever that is, <laughs> in the sky, in the ground, just wherever it is. Uh, so I, uh, Joseph, if you're, if you're watching this, whenever you're watching uh, this video, I love you. And uh, this is part of my journey to jazz. And I hope uh, you uh, check out some of this music as well. Probably some of it you already have. This one's a little different because instead of uh, showcasing one year, I want to talk about how I got into jazz and my life uh, as a jazz fan. And it really started in 1970. And obviously, a lot of people our age, we heard jazz. We heard Vince Guaraldi's playing Charlie Brown's Christmas and all those. And we didn't think of those as jazz. We didn't necessarily know specifically what jazz was. We might have watched, uh, you know, cop movies and noir films with sort of the jazzy Harlem Nocturne type, uh, you know, sexy lounge thing. We didn't know what that was. But we, we were definitely well aware of jazz and jazz singers and jazz musicians, uh, even crossover artists like Louis Armstrong and Nat Cole. Well, Nat Cole is one of my all-time favorite, and Ella Fitzgerald, and and uh, so many others. But in terms of actually into music, obviously my musical taste comes from rock and roll, starting with the Beatles, psychedelia, San Francisco, and on. Um, but there are some records that are pivotal records here. So this isn't a history overview of jazz for someone new to learn about everything. But you might pick up uh, some records here if you're a newbie to jazz and if you want to dip your uh, foot into jazz. I don't think anything is particularly challenging here because this is the sort of signposts and bookmarks that showcase uh, the music that I got into, uh, little, a few little stories that are kind of fun. Some I've told on other videos, but I want to put them in this particular package. So if it's a, a repetitive thing, so be it. So I'm going to go to 1970. I remember specifically being with my friend Steve and my friend Larry in Berkeley, California, right alongside the campus. There was a series of record stores. There was Leopold's Records. Uh, there was a Tower Records right there and uh, several others, and I saw this record. Now, of course, I had heard about Miles Davis. I knew who he was, but I hadn't bought a Miles Davis record up to 1970. I just knew who he was, and I, uh, I'd i see him, I, I think, on television, possibly. But I bought this because I heard about it a little bit. Uh, I don't remember if there's a review in Rolling Stone, but I heard this was a little more rock and roll-centric or rock-centric and funky, so I bought it, and I love this uh you know, this wonderful, wonderful uh, cover. I mean, this is a, a classic record. So I bought this record in 1970 in Berkeley, brought it home, and to be honest with you, I didn't get it. I don't think I didn't really l not like it, but I just, it didn't, it, it, it wasn't in my wheelhouse. It was challenging, not in the right way of where I was in 1970. Of course, that's the year the Beatles split up and let it be, and uh, good year for music all around, and especially this. And you all know historically how this transformed uh, his career. And he really uh, wanted to cross over. And, of course, you know, playing at the Fillmore Auditorium, I think, in 71, uh, he wanted to, you know, see all these white cat kids playing, you know, bands, playing 5,000 people once when he's playing the small clubs and playing a week what he could get paid for one night or probably... You know, for a month, he could get in one night playing the Fillmore. Uh, so I actually returned this record. I don't know exactly how I did that, but I got rid of it. Returned it to the store. I don't know. Those days, maybe you would put a scratch on it. And they make you get the same thing. Some stories were more liberal than others. But 
Three years later, when I got my first job in a record store, uh, I heard someone playing this in the store. And I thought, what is that? And I realized what it was, and it hit me. It moved me. I bought it, and ever since then, I've loved this record. Love this record. Now, just in terms of uh, uh, showcasing my musical taste, this is my number one favorite uh, Miles Davis record. This came. This is right before that, 1969. I think this is the sweet spot for me in this kind of mix with John McLaughlin on guitar here. And of course, Tony Williams, Dave Holland, Wayne Shorter, Chick Corea, uh, electric pianos are, are added and that, you know, interesting, great guitar player of McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Uh, but this was the one, uh, after that, I listened to this because I wanted to get into more miles. And I was first getting into more of the electric miles. Then later I'd go back and, and kind of blue and, um, you know, all the other records. But um, I just wanted to showcase this because it is my all-time favorite jazz record. Didn't jump in and buy a lot of jazz records, but in 1972, I bought myself my first component stereo system. I went to an actual hi-fi store on Fillmore Street in San Francisco with my buddy Steve and listened to these records. I ended up getting some AR speakers, a Sherwood receiver, and a dual turntable. And I really loved that system. I had had record players before, pull down Magnavoxes. I had one sort of uh, Magnavox separate thing, all in one in a way, where the speakers detached and you could put aside. But in 72, is I, I got my real, real components. That Sherwood receiver I really enjoyed. And two records they played while I was auditioning the speakers one of which uh, was Pentangle's first album from 1968. I hadn't heard it before with jo with um, Bert Janch and John Renburn and Jackie McChan vocals and uh, Cox and uh, the bass player. I'm blanking out right now. That first album, but the song they kept playing was the final song on the album called Waltz, which is an acoustic folk jazz record. I'm not showing that here, but I highly recommend that record. I loved how that record sounded. It's such a great a sound, a great recording. And the other one they played was this. This is a CTI record, of course, we all know, Creed Taylor's label, and his stuff is really well recorded. To this day, some people think the CTI series is slick. I tend to agree somewhat, but there's certain things I really enjoy. But it opens up with Lee Morgan's track, Speedball. Of course, at the time, I didn't know who Lee Morgan was. And this is Cherry by Stanley Turrentine with Milt Jackson on Vibes. And I, after this, I also got into Milt Jackson and Modern Jazz Quartet. I just, I like that kind of moodiness of MJQ and the vibe sound and Stanley Turrentine. I love this opening track, Speedball, the Lee Morgan track. And I was into photography, taking pictures on my own. And I noticed a name in here, Pete Turner, who was a professional uh, commercial photographer that I really started following more and more during this period. And you could send for prints, although I never sent for prints or, or posters. But um, these were beautiful, slick covers and slick records. But I love this record and still means a lot to me. And as slick as it is, I think this is a wonderful record. And in 1972, 17, 18 years old. Uh, this was an, a continuation of my entry into music. Another record I remember picking up at Tower Records, uh, even though it had been, you know, 10 years or so or more after the uh, Bossa Nova craze, but one of my first records was Getz and Gilberto. And I remember reading an interview in Playboy magazine from 1964, 60, I think it's 64, might have been 65, when the Beatles were interviewed for Playboy. I got a copy of it at this point, just for the articles, by the way. And uh, within that article, they were asking John about music he liked to listen to. And he mentioned uh, Getz and Iguana. That was, you know how John Lennon would twist words? So he mentions Get, Getz and Iguana. Of course, I I can't remember if they corrected it in the article, but I figured it out. It was Getz and Gilberto. And of course, Girl of Ip Girl from Ipanema I had heard, and I've heard some of the stuff uh, with Stan Getz and uh, featuring Antonio Carlos Jobim. So I picked this album up uh, also at Tower Records because I'd go there a lot and I would sniff through the jazz sections, whether even though I didn't really know what I was looking at, I didn't buy a lot yet. Uh, that would come in a couple years later. But 72, I started dipping my toes into jazz. I then 
got turned on to this album. This was a really special change in my taste in music or a, an evolution or an added extension. I, sh I should say, say an addition. All of a sudden, I didn't switch from rock and roll and, and get jump into jazz. That wasn't, jazz was always sort of on the peripheral side of my taste. And this is the album I got. This is the first album I ever got in ECM Records. This is a German pressing I got in the import section at Tower Records. I think initially, as I recall, all the ECMs were uh, German imports until they got distributed here. And I think Polygram or, God, I can't remember, a and a, a couple different labels over the years distributed them, and they were eventually pressed in the U.S. But um, this is an ECM of Chick Corea's Return to Forever, the first album I absolutely love this album. It's got a pop sensibility. It's got a Brazilian uh, Ayerto and Flor Perim, married couple from Brazil, just changed things. I love the vocals and the lyrics of uh, Flora on here. And she really just, just this record uh, really got to me. I play this record all the time. Return of Forever, Crystal Silence, but what game shall we play today is a very pop, uh, Brazilian pop jazz record. Chick is on electric keyboards here. Uh, you got um, great bass playing by Stan Clark. I didn't know, you know, Stanley Clark, we would, I would get to know later. And Joe Farrell, who I didn't know at the time either, plays flute and sax on this. And this was a, a, a game changer for me with my musical taste. And the following year in 73, the follow-up, which I can, I think this is the only specific follow-up, Light as a Feather. Better album, possibly, uh, the songs, uh, 500 Miles High. That was the kicker here. But also, Light as a Feather, Captain Marvel, Children's Song, Spain. You know, songs written by Chick and Flora and Stanley Clark. Uh, this is a wonderful record. This is on... Polydor Records, this was a, uh, an American edition. This is the exact copy I got in 1973. I played to this day. It still sounds great. It's in beautiful shape. And uh, it's an incredible record. Once they got into their more harder fusion, I kind of lost interest. Although then uh, Chick Corea did an album several years later on a double album called Spanish Heart, which I absolutely adore. And I kind of liked when he did his electric in there, but the, the more Return to Forever Warriors and those uh, fusion things, I wasn't a huge fan of. And remember, around this time, or I think it was at 74, uh, Jeff Beck's album, Blow by Blow, came out, which were produced by George Martin, which is essentially kind of a rock fusion album as well. And as much as I try, I, I have it and I like it and... and uh, but I never loved it like people. That and Wired, people who love Jeff Beck just love it. And I have both those records, but they just didn't, they don't speak to me. The other record, and I think I, because when I finally got into that um, in, in a Silent Way album, I went back to an album from 1970 and I got this album. And I think I bought this probably in 73 as well. And this is uh, My Goals Beyond. And this is uh, the first album by John McLaughlin on his own I ever got. This is, I think, this is the first album where he used Mahavishnu, John McLaughlin. Uh, someone's going to correct me if I'm wrong on that. That's totally okay. But I checked this out because I, I, I hadn't heard it, but I heard about it. And, I, you know, growing up with the Beatles and getting turned on to George Harrison and uh, Indian music and uh, Ravi Shankar and Radha Krishna Temple, I... Obviously, uh, the iconic, you know, the Krishna and Bhagavad I'm going to say that wrong. It's not Inagata Vita. I know the difference. But this is an acoustic album, and this is a beautiful album. Uh, this is on Douglas Records, I think, which is a, um, a sub-label of Columbia and Epic. And this is a beautiful, meditative album. And around this time, there are a few albums I was getting into, it, which were sort of meditative, spacey albums. Paul Horn's Inside, also Inside the Taj Mahal, was a great one. Tony Scott's Music for Zen Meditation. Those records we would sell once I got a job in the record business and record stores. We'd play those records. And obviously being in San Francisco, California, everyone, you know, there's always people that wanted meditative, kind of moody records. Um, the soothing sound of 
jazz, neoclassical things. Uh, but this record really, really spoke to me too. And I really liked that. I wasn't getting into uh, Blue Note records yet. And uh, that whole uh, thing, that would come a little bit later when I got my job in the record store. So let's talk about that. 1973, I get my first job in a record store at the Warehouse Records, a California chain. The next year, I moved to a local Bay Area, quote, hipper record store that wasn't more the corporate larger chain. And that was the Record Factory based out of San Francisco. And I worked at a um, store in the Inner Sunset right by Golden Gate Park in an old Bank America building. We'd go down in the bank, smoke joints in the old vault down in the basement. It was a great, it, it was the funnest job I've had in my entire life. I met so many great people. Some uh, I'm still friends with today. I met uh, Jazz Shit Brooks came in. I'll talk about him in a little bit. And we ended up hiring him. He was my first college roommate when I moved out of my parents' house. But one night, I was driving home when I finally got my apartment in San Francisco in 1974. And I moved in with Jazz uh, Brooks. Be polite on that name there. And I heard this. Now, I have heard... Ella Fitzgerald. I knew who she was. I saw her on television. She was everywhere. But the radio at night, it was like midnight. I was driving through Golden Gate Park, and I heard these last two cuts that melt together. And this is live in Berlin. I believe this is recorded in 1960. And it's Mac the Knife and How High the Moon and her scatting. These are the definitive versions of her doing that. Now, I love all her songbook records or, uh, on her own with uh, Louis Armstrong. Love those. But I think she shines on her live uh performances. Now, I did a video a year or two ago, the best female singer in the entire universe. I uh, gave that nod to Ella Fitzgerald. Obviously, there's so many different styles and moods, but that was my take, and I'll stick by that um, that stance. But when I heard this, it goes on for, what is it, eight minutes, Mac the Knife, and then How High the Moon goes be even longer. The scatting on that, where she kind of screws up the words and goes on, Oh my God, I couldn't believe that. I heard on the radio. So the next morning when I went to work at the record shop, I went in, of course, in the jazz section. Uh, we had a copy and I grabbed this. This is the copy I grabbed on Verve Records. Of course, Verve Records was the label that Norman Grant started because he was managing Ella Fitzgerald and he really started the label for her and that grew. And I started learning more about the labels. Of course, when you work in a record store, you you to learn about the label. So my uh, my boss, his name was Vernon. He turned me on to a lot of roots and country music. And we didn't really have people to manage a section, although it's just because of people's tastes, someone would handle the country section or the, or the folk section or the rock and roll or the import section or, of course, uh, the jazz section. This is actually one of the uh, hitters for the, our jazz section from the record factory. And I still have it to this day. And... I kind of, for a while, wanted to do the inventories on the jazz section to learn about jazz records. So I, uh, I I took this. I stole it. I mean, we'd get these and we'd order more. So it wasn't like I'm ripping off the store. But um, I started doing inventory in the jazz section just to learn the names of the artists. And one day, this is kind of a fun story, too. One day, this old woman walks in, elderly woman, probably my age now. No, she was probably in her 70s. And she says, do you have any records by Vince Guaraldi? A perfect impression of her. And I said, yeah, I think we did some in a jazz section. He did all the, the Peanuts and the Charlie Brown. He goes, yes. So I walk over to the jazz section and we're a small store. We don't just say go to aisle three. It wasn't a huge store, but you walk the thing is in retail, you walk over, you grab a record, you put it in the customer's hand. So they want to buy it. You make them want to buy it. And I hand her like the section. I think I'd probably pull the header out, the Vince Guaraldi header, because um, he was born in San Francisco, by the way. And it's, so this woman says, oh, I'm glad you have his records. I'm his mother. So I thought that was really cool. I think this was a year, year or two before he died. I think he died in 76 or 77. Uh, young age, and is what, 47 or so, but um, I knew his music, and it was just sort of touching talking to Vince Guaraldi's mother then. At the same time, I was going to San Francisco State 
a university in the broadcasting department with Brooks, and I became the program director, uh, no, the um, music director of the college radio station for a while, and I had a DJ show. Uh, I don't think my DJ show was very successful at that time. Uh, I didn't have my act together, but um, I, through an internship, did something with KQED, which was the local public broadcasting station, and KQED Radio uh, had started a live jazz show, and I don't remember how I got the connection, probably through college, and I got to do interns on several location recordings, and one day, one of my favorites was at the College of Marin, and we did a live recording with Earl Father Hines, and I had heard his name. I didn't really know much about him. What an amazing piano player. Obviously, at this point, he was, God, he must have been in the 70s at that point. One of the most generous people I've ever met. Uh, I got to into his records. This is actually a 1966 recording, Once Upon a Time. He really comes out of the, the 40s, uh, you know, where he got more known uh, into uh, bebop and uh, just post-bebop. Not even, not hard bop or at all. But uh, I really enjoyed this show and this concert and uh, this performance and just hanging around him for probably four or five hours from the setup uh, to the performance and a little bit after. And Obviously, I'd get to know him even more. In 76, he collaborated with Ry Cooter on um, Paradise and Lunch, did a, a version of Diddy Wah Diddy, and the piano on that is so amazing, and Ry Cooter's acoustic guitar. So that was a big thing for me. But working in the record store, I got into so many uh, artists that I'd play and pick up. And I'm going to go through a few of them, but I need to show this record because this was... Uh, and also an iconic record. And it was something that really crossed over at the time when I was working in the store. And I had listened to uh, the Lucerne album he did, the three record set on ECM, and that's Keith Jarrett's Colton concert. Now the other one came out in 72 or 73. This came out in 1975. And um, this was an infamous show because I think the piano was a little off according to Keith Jarrett. And he moans throughout a little bit. And it got to be a running joke of Keith Jarrett's moaning. But this is a good ambient, beautiful recorded record. And every time we play this in the store, everyone would buy it. And people would buy it. And this became the biggest selling piano album of all time in that moment, in that time. I don't know where we are now. I think Kind of Blue probably is at, at this point. Manfred Eicher, a label again on ECM. Around this time, you know, Brooks and I were living together. Uh, we were roommates, and we only lived a block from the record store. We both worked in, we were both in a radio station, uh, and we went to see a lot of shows. We started going uh, to the Keystone Corner, which was, at that time, the premier jazz club in San Francisco. We had a thing every morning. Whoever got up first would run to the living room, put a record on the turntable, and half the time, or more than half the time, Brooks would put on a jazz record, and I would jokingly say, you're always putting on jazz shit. So that's how the name Jazz Shit Brooks uh, came to be. You know, jazz wasn't a huge sell of that. We had K-Jazz uh, was the big premier uh, jazz station, which wasn't a huge audience, but it was a great jazz station in San Francisco. But um, the Keystone, Berkeley Community Theater, a few places in Berkeley, um, Club Yoshi's would start later, which was a combination sushi restaurant jazz thing. That's still in existence in Oakland now. Uh, gone were the jazz uh, clubs that you see in live records, like the Black Hawk and the Jazz Workshop. Those are way before my time. Um, but I did see, let me do a shout out. I, I forgot to mention when I was showing that Miles Davis record. In the end of 1972, I went to the Frost Amphitheater in uh, Stanford University outside, and I went to see the new Riders of the Purple Sage, and Miles Davis opened up. He did, he played for about just under an hour. It seemingly uh, sounded like one piece, but I got a recording years later. Someone sent me a link to a live, and I, re, you know, it was pretty wild. That was around the time of Live Evil, I think a little after that, uh, then the following year. So you can understand what he was doing this fusion, they had tabla players. Um, 
really interesting, but opening up for the new riders, which was that country cowboy offshoot of the Grateful Dead was a bizarre, a bizarre um, duo of uh, live music. There was also a place called Bach Dynamite Dining and Dancing, which was a down in Miramar Beach, down on the way to Half Moon Bay, about 35 minutes south of San Francisco, right on the beach. It was like a beach house. And in early days, you would walk in, you wouldn't really pay, you'd put some money in the till, donation, you know, grab a beer out of the refrigerator and watch these performers. And some of the performers that would play all week at the Keystone Corner would show up the next morning on Sunday morning after playing a week in San Francisco and play this afternoon gig. And one I saw there was Bill Evans. And, uh, the only other time I saw Bill Evans was in 1980 when he did uh, a series at the Keystone. Oh, and then I saw him with um, at the Great American Music Hall uh, with uh, Tony Bennett when they did their album together. So Bill Evans was one of those. Dexter Gordon, again, I'm just showing albums that represent. Obviously, I didn't see this period. But I saw him three times, I think, at the Keystone. Very tall man. I loved in the 70s, uh, him live. His albums on Columbia, I wasn't a huge fan of, but seeing him live, tall man, and was great after every song when the audience really applauded. He'd hold his hands out with a saxophone as if he was offering them uh, to us as an offering, as a thank you, and really wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. Around this time, I also saw Horace Silver, and uh, this is an album that I latched on to. Of course, a lot of people my generation latched onto this once we heard it because the opening song, song My Father, has that riff, dun, da dun, da dun, da dun, that Stilly Dan would, would acquire for Ricky Don't Lose That Number. Over the years, I saw McCoy Tyner and Art Blakey. McCoy Tyner was like the heaviest piano player I remember seeing him. We used to kind of refer to him as the Led Zeppelin of piano playing because he really pounded those keys. Uh, Bobby Hutcherson was living in the Bay Area. I saw him a bunch of times. Uh, Art Pepper I saw at the key, at the uh, Keystone. Uh, Yusef Latif, Jimmy Smith. I also would see um, Cal Jader and Gabor Zabo a lot because they would play around the Bay Area. They lived in the Bay Area. So they would play these other clubs as well and some of the clubs that were like bar clubs in North Beach, and uh, just really fun things. Elvin Jones, of course, Art Blakey, I mentioned Art Blakey. Um, just a great, great time to see these people, and me in my early 20s uh, seeing this great jazz. In 1978, I finally get a record job at ABC Records, and I only worked there for a couple of years because in 79, MCA bought ABC. I got laid off, got rehired again for MCA for a year just to help with them with inventories and in-store promotions and things. So I had a three-year period working for the ABC MCA thing. And as much as, you know, we, the catalogs then were Steely Dan and Tom Petty and Jimmy Buffett and a big country catalog. But a great thing, which was a learning thing for me, aside from the record store, in-store learning of jazz, was ABC Records, ABC Impulse Records, I should say. And at that point, I acquired a, a good amount uh, of records because we could get so many records a month for free from the label and then pay a little bit, like a fraction at the time. Now, unfortunately, during my 95 purge, I got rid of a lot of my jazz records, not all of them, because I figured I'm going to get them on CD. They'll sound better. Big mistake. This was a period of the green label of, uh, of Impulse Records. But these are a few artists that I really jumped in on. Of course, Art Blakey. I got m most of his albums that were in print at the time. I really loved the powerful drumming of Art Blakey. And of course, since I had seen him several times at the Keystone, I loved him. Uh, I mentioned Gabor Zabo, who I'd seen, but of course, he didn't have many albums on Impulse, but this is one I really liked because it was kind of that raga, spiritual, Indian uh, thing I really, really enjoy. Now, some records stayed in print and some didn't. This was one of my favorites I got. Uh, this is obviously a later issue, but obviously the Black Saint and the Sinner Lady an important record and one of my favorite, of course, Impulse has those great orange spines. And 
you know, you can't deny, you know, the thing that really kept alive Impulse for years was John Coltrane. And obviously he was long gone by the time I worked at ABC. But I really got into, uh, obviously, Love Supreme and most of his records, even his out there records. So I, at the time, probably got 30 records on uh, Impulse. And the stuff that was coming out new were the reissues when I worked for ABC. So if you've seen this, these kind of series, these comps, that have uh, outtakes and alternate versions and things. These were double twofers that came out. And for a long time, you know, I was promoting and selling these. So that was my take at, at ABC, getting into this great jazz. And there's some things I just never got into. Um, Alice Coltrane was one. Interesting story about Alice Coltrane. I think it was 1971 or 72, my buddy Larry, who was a drummer, and he was into... He was into jazz a little before me too, but he was into more of the um, West Coast white jazz. Uh, the um, you know also people like uh, Dave Brubeck and and Maynard Ferguson and the big bands that kind of stuff. But for whatever reason, and I'm not quite sure why, he talked me into going to the Brooklyn Community Theater to see Alice Coltrane and that re reissue that came out this year. This was recorded, I believe, just a year or two prior to when we saw her, and that's out there. It was. It was the strangest concert experience I had seen at the time. A couple years later, I had seen obviously Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart, and that wasn't even as wild as uh, this. So I had never heard this record until um, this reissue came out this past year. I love this now. I don't know if I would have loved it back in 72-ish, 71, 72, but it was really great seeing Alice Coltrane and um, the only member that I knew that was that played with her at the time uh, that I'd heard because of, I can't remember what other record, but it was Charlie Hayden played bass on that show. Now, my last kind of personal story is uh, in 1978, I went to the Monterey Jazz Festival uh, with my uh, girlfriend at the time, Nancy, and she was managing an artist, Mel Martin, Mel Martin and Listen, who was on Inner City Records. Mel Martin had been a, a, a sax player and a soprano sax player, and he had played with Boz Skaggs' band, the blues band, early on on Moments and, and Boz Skaggs and band. And he was playing around a lot in the Bay Area. And Listen had two albums, I believe, on um, Inner City, and they played that year in 78. So we were at the K-Jazz booth. K-Jazz was a station that broadcast the show live, and we were up in the booth there. It was an upstairs area, and between, obviously, uh, the live performances, they do interviews and things. There was a table where they were broadcasting, and I was sitting there, and this guy sits down to me to be interviewed. And I don't know why I was there next to him, and it was Dizzy Gillespie. And I had been a fan of Dizzy Gillespie since my uh, record store days. Uh, this is a record from 1976 when I worked in stores that I just picked up. I loved. This is a Savoy uh, reissue, the Savoy Sessions of DG Days. I am a big, big fan of Bebop, and I try to always show uh, Charlie Parker records, Dizzy Gillespie music. My favorite jazz artist ever is Charlie Parker, but I digress here a little bit. But I want to just set the tone and set the time. So I'm sitting next to Dizzy Gillespie, and of course... Dizzy Gillespie there is stoned off his ass and he's smoking a joint and they're interviewing him. I don't say a word the entire time. I'm not part of it. And I was 24 years old sitting next to this jazz great. And they asked him if he can read this spot for Tower Records. And it was an ad for Tower Records and he reads uh, the copy. And he goes, I remember there's a, there used to be a, round hotel across the street from Tower Records uh, called the Romano or the Ramada or the room, you know, and I used to go in there and it was the greatest place and they had a cool uh, cafe in the front. And I specifically remember that. And I remember that hotel, they tore it down eventually, but it was right across of Tower Records, Columbus and Bay in San Francisco, Fisherman's Wharf. But to sit next to Dizzy Gillespie, I mean, I was in awe of this man. Of course, uh, if you don't know his uh, work, you need to get some Dizzy Gillespie in your collection. So uh, that was one of the highlights of my jazz life. So I want to thank you for watching Memories of a Vinyl Junkie again, this journey in jazz, my personal journey and pathway uh, through jazz records and jazz music. 
this is a, a, a genre that I really appreciate. I have a collection now of, I don't know, about 15, 1,600 jazz records. I'm going to showcase that a little bit right here as I'm closing out. Uh, it's been a really amazing uh, time in 2023 and 22 in the world of jazz reissues. Records are selling more than ever in the jazz genre. A lot of people I've seen who are rock fans and country fans have dived in because of these great reissues. Blue Note with their classic series and Blue Note 80 series and their Tone Poet series, Acoustic Sounds with their Verve series and their Prestige series. They've been putting out really wonderful uh, mastered versions of it. I just think this is, uh, this is the one of the best times to get into jazz. Jazz records are selling more than ever. Um, these reissues of black jazz, a, a very a 70s uh, label from the East Bay that I'd seen because we sold those records, but I had never heard those. So I've been jumping into those records as well. It's just a wonderful time. The avant-garde, the free jazz, the Ornette Coleman box set that Tone Poet put out. There's so many amazing options out there. Even, you know, if you're not into jazz a lot, I do want to uh, show one record in the very end, and that is this Cannonball Adderley record. I would say if push comes to shove and someone asks me, what is my all-time favorite jazz record, be this. It's an accessible record. It's Cannonball Adderley with Miles Davis, Hank Jones, Sam Jones, and Art Blakey. Some say this is really a Miles Davis record, lead record, because he wasn't signed to the label and he really couldn't lead a session. Who knows? It doesn't matter. No, it's a beautiful record. I just love this is a Music Matters jazz edition. I think there's a Blue Note classic version of this, and I highly recommend this as I close out this area of uh, Memories of Vinyl Junkie, My Jazz Journey. So thank you for watching. I do appreciate all your comments and your support, and enjoy jazz in the new year and for the rest of your life. Mazzy absolutely <laughs> loves jazz. Take care.